This conference will now be recorded. Let me also say that uh, Doug McLeod is going to be with us today. I don't know if he's on yet or not, but uh, he will be, I expect, soon. And we're happy to have him with us. He's going to go over the new budget. Significant issue for a finance committee, as near as I can tell. So, um, it's, if people have a chance to look at the at the uh, meeting summary from last, I did. I I read it and didn't really see anything that was anything other than that was slipped in by those two guys. <laughs> Looks right to me. No, it looks fine to me. Okay. Anybody else got any comments? All right. Let's move on then. We've got a big agenda today, as you well know. So, um, let's start with we're, we're scheduled to start uh, with Mr. McLeod, but I don't know that he's on yet. So, we do have him signed up. He did agree to join us, didn't he? he? He did. He did, Rut. And I know I exchanged an email with him this morning, so I knew he was he, he was still planning on it. Um, well, good. So we're, I planning, don't... we're planning on him too. <laughs> so, um, so let's go ahead and move on uh, since he's not here yet. Uh, then I think rather than waiting, unless he suddenly pops up, uh, we'll move on to the uh, discussion of agenda item four, which is the peer transit agency task programs and best practices example. Uh, unfortunately, that's about 10 minutes. So what I might do instead is talk about the meetings that I had on immunizations. And that'll give him a little more time to get here rather than locking something in. That's uh, my discussion on this is, I think, fairly brief. Then I'll make it that way. Um, so I actually, on the week of the night of the 16th of November, I met with three different organizations to talk about the future role that RTD might play in, in vaccinations. And um, the first one, as it should have been, was with the RTD, with Mike Meter and Bill Van Meter. And uh, and it was really quite a good meeting. Uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more later. But I also met with Governor Polis' office, and uh, I met with CDPHE. And uh, that was the week that we really saw the first real big jump in COVID cases. And so that, I must say, got in the way of some things. Casey Wolf, who was going to be with us from the governor's office and leads efforts there, was immediately called away to a meeting uh, when the numbers came in. So the primary goal of the meetings was really to better understand how RTD might fit into this whole thing and how they might uh, be able to provide uh, some value and uh, the resources that they might have. And so I made it clear in every one of these meetings that there were discussions, they were exploratory in nature, and none of this has been approved by anyone at RTD. And any of it uh, actually happening would be subject to that. But I wanted to get a feel for what they valued and what they saw that could really add, uh, add to that process. Uh, Mike and Bill really provided a lot of good feedback on what might be possible and what some of the challenges might be. And based on their suggestions, I eliminated some of the ideas from the subsequent meetings. Uh, but that said, it's still clear there's a lot of opportunity for RTD to play a significant role in vaccinating Colorado. Uh, Governor Polis's office it was a good discussion, but you know, without Casey there, it really there really are next steps. <laughs> so I think I'm going to have to get back uh, with Casey. She was very enthusiastic about meeting on this first part. And so I think I'll be able to uh, reschedule with her when things settle down a little bit. With the governor and his partner both home with COVID, I'm sure it's it's harder than ever. Uh, at CDPAG, I was fortunate to have, have uh, Diana there. 
she is the person that that is managing all the back vaccine distribution planning efforts at CDPHG, um, and uh, really was, I thought, a, a, a good discussion. Uh, she is extremely knowledgeable about it. Uh, there were slides I did not need <laughs> because she already knew all that, as, as did her staff. They're really in the in the middle of trying to get this done, uh, get all the, the groups they need to do some vaccinations signed up, uh, and they're focused almost entirely on phase one. And phase one is, is getting the healthcare workers and the uh, um, senior facilities, senior living facilities, uh, the folks that are in there vaccinated, where we've had so many deaths, and also the first responders. And uh, the, the idea of mass clinics is dependent very much, and that's really the part that RTV would be playing a role in, that's dependent very much on uh, vaccine availability, and it still may be a few months out. So, you know, they're putting out the real hot fires right now. But you did suggest that I reach out to some of the community health care organizations, and uh, I really, I'm, I'm quite interested in following up on that. And uh, I think we have, I don't know, Daya, I think Daya may have some connections there, uh, but I'd like to I'd like to see how we might be able to help because they're going to be the ones at the pointy end of the spear. They're going to be the ones actually doing that round of vaccinations. So I learned a lot from the meetings. Uh, I revised a lot of the stuff that I had in my proposals and in my PowerPoints and from that, it was really good input. So. I was pleased with that. Doug, uh, we jumped ahead to this one. It's a shorter uh, agenda item. And uh, so I, I I thought we'd delay your appearance for just a little bit, but I appreciate you being with us today. Before I move on though, does anybody have any questions about the meetings that I just discussed? Okay, Doug, you're on. Uh, great, thank you. And I apologize for being late. I had a meeting that ran over just a bit. So uh, oh, thank you. For... Really? <laughs> yes. Right. Never so, thank, thanks for covering for me, Rut. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thanks for being so, here. Um, so I put together a, a quick presentation. Um, I wasn't exactly sure what you wanted to see. So if I'm headed in the wrong direction, just please redirect me. Or if you have questions, just uh, holler. Um, well, and hopefully I realize that, you've got a lot to cover in 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll be quiet and let you get on with it. Um, okay. I don't know, Ron, who's controlling this to let yeah, Doug... Yeah, uh, Doug, I have made you, I have given you presenter privileges, so at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to click on screen and share your share your screen to for your presentation. Oh, great. That's helpful. Thank you. Share your screen and... Okay, can you see the presentation? Not yet. All right. My uh, my screen uh, icon shows an X through it and it's grayed out. When I click on it, it won't let me do anything. Still nothing. Yeah. Uh, there, there you we go. go. You should, that should work now, Doug. Sorry about that. All right. Now, hopefully, you can see it. Yep. Looks good. All right. Good. Good. And there's probably more slides in here. Some of them are just informational, so I'll go through them fairly quickly. But um, let's see. So I basically took a presentation that's been given to the board. So this will look very familiar to Director Geisinger, um, but I updated some of the numbers. Um, so back in September, August, September timeframe, we, and we've been talking to the board for quite a while about our uh, budget challenges um, after the COVID pandemic hit. And we um, were very concerned about our revenues, particularly our sales and use tax revenues. Uh, going forward because those make up about two-thirds of our um, revenue sources 
um, we really started looking at what does this mean for RTD and we've gone through several iterations because we, until we got into May, June timeframe, we didn't know what our actual sales and use tax results were going to be. Going to be. Um, so uh, it's taken a few months to kind of get a better idea of how we're progressing and that helped develop the budget. Um, but during that time period, during September, um, the board helped us come up with some budget reduction principles and some other uh, guidance to help us with the challenges we faced. And so I won't go through all of these, but those are kind of the um, principles that were set forth. Hey, Doug, sorry to interrupt. Can you can you put that in presenter mode or zoom in? It's a little hard to see on the screens. Oh, sure. Let's see. I've got some... Let me see if I can click on this because I've got things over on my right hand that are in the way of my buttons. You. Oh. You probably go to the. Doug, you can click. And it'll take the rest of the screen out. If you go further to the right, down on the bottom, there's that little screen thing. Yeah. Yeah. Further to the right. Further, further, further. Nope. Not. Nope. The the back to the left a little bit. Nope. The the, the fourth. I oh. Sorry. Well, let you me. When your when your cursor is pointing at the right thing and you can oh. click. How about that? You're getting close. There we are. So I had um. Sorry, I had uh, the screen in the way of, on my view. So. Yeah. You see the presenter screen two over. There, try that. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so here's uh, basically our, our budgeting process. So um, we can, we basically adopt a single budget each year. We're on a calendar fiscal year basis. So uh, we go to the board in November to adopt our annual budget for the final, for the next year. Um, actually, last year we went in December because we had some changes that uh, we wanted to make last minute. Uh, we also do a midterm financial plan, which is a six-year plan, and that's based off the budget in the first year. So we try to provide the board um, an outlook going out six years. And all of this, of course, is based on us having a balanced budget each year. So with um, obviously the swings that we anticipate and additional needs for expenditures, especially capital expenditures that pop up, um, we try to do a, a, a look out six years to, to um, forecast, you know, how, how are the ups and downs going to work out for us. Um, then we also produce a long range financial plan, which um, everybody on from Dr. Cog is familiar with. That's a 30 year plan that we submit through Dr. Cog um, on occasion uh, just for the transportation improvement plan or the TIP. We haven't done that long range financial plan for, um, we were supposed to do it this year. Dr. Cog gave us um, a, a reprieve and we're going to produce that in 2021 um, just because there's so much uncertainty right now. So some of the impacts that we had to our budget, obviously you all know about these. Um, our ridership has been down 60% since April. Um, along with that, our fares, which make up about 15 to 20% of our revenue are down 50%. They're not down as much as uh, our ridership is because we have the pass programs, the Eco Pass, College Pass, et cetera. So while people are still aren't riding, we still have that revenue from the um, the companies that are involved in that. But you know, there's some uncertainty there. We've al already had a couple of colleges um, wanting to uh, pull out or wait to see what happens um, in terms of having in-person classes because our students aren't traveling right now. But um, their students pay a, a fee as part of their tuition, which goes to pay for our eco, or our, sorry, our, uh, yeah, college passes. And of course, we have the economic impacts of sales and use taxes, and then we have additional costs that we've had to deal with for uh, personal protective equipment, um, getting people set up for remote work, and then there's the uncertainty of it all going forward. So that's really driven a lot of the decision making um, based on what we know at this point in time. Um, I want to just put out just some comparisons of um, you know what what we've looked like over the last couple of years, um, starting with 2019 actuals, and I just kind of grouped these in some general categories. Um, but you know, so I guess some noteworthy items would be um, that fares. You can see our fares have decreased substantially. So 
we're at about 50 percent currently in 2020 we had a couple of months january and february obviously that before the um the pandemic hit that we were doing just fine then the bottom fell out and we're running at about 50 percent so we expect to collect about 93 million this year um, and then about 88 million next year. So we've assumed that we're gonna collect about 55% of our anticipated normal fares next year. Sales and use tax. So we were clipping along really nicely, 659 million in 2019, and then the pandemic hit. Um, our forecast for this year is 501 million. So there's a, a drop of 150 million there. And then we have, we do anticipate somewhat of a recovery because our actuals have been better than anticipated. So we're back up close to where we thought we would be um, in 2019, at least we're about where we were in 2021, hopefully. Um, I put the CARES grant money in here separately just so you could see. So our total revenues in 2019 were a billion 69. Um, we dropped down to 937. So without the CARES Act, obviously that would have been a, a big hit to us where we would have had to make um, severe adjustments to our expenses in 2020, but we haven't had to do that. And some of those adjustments are really coming in 2021. So you can see our revenues are pretty steady in, from those two years, but then we're gonna drop again in 2021 because we don't have any additional CARES funding. Uh, moving on, you can see where our operating expenses fall. Um, I excluded depreciation since that's kind of a non-cash cost in the short term. Um, the big one for us is debt service. So we're only showing the most recent years here, but if you were to look at our uh, six-year midterm financial plan, this debt service number increases because right now in fast tracks, we're mainly just paying interest on our debt then we start paying principal. So that's where our real struggles are gonna be going forward is on the fast track side of things, um, paying that debt. Uh, so that's gonna grow. And of course we'll need the revenues to pay for that. So as that grows, that puts pressure on the availability of funding for our other categories, such as operating expenses and capital expenditures. So I just point out on this, that our capital expenditures were pretty significant in 2019 and we've pretty much cut out everything um, in 2020 and 2021. So that's gonna have an impact on our long-term asset management plan. And I'll, I have a slide a little bit later, it kind of points out the, the size of that problem. Any questions there so far? Mr. Mr. Right. Chair, can you indulge me with a question? Yeah, I, I, you know, I just keep looking at that debt number and fast tracks and boy, it is. The debt, when principal kicks in as well, that's going to be a really tough hill to climb, especially when we've got maintenance costs and we have other things that are, I'm sure we're starting to push some of that out, but it catches up with you. you got to get the roof, you got to maintain your roof, right? Or the whole Absolutely. Yeah. So and that was kind of one of our things in our budgeting processes all along. So one of our ma mantras earlier in prior years was build as much as we can as fast as we can until it's all done. But the other thing that we had to take into consideration is we can build all these things and incur the debt, but we have to have money to operate them too. So if you were to look out um, in the next few years uh, the, on the fast track side, about 80% of the uh, funding sources on fast tracks get used to service debt. So it's a significant burden for them. Yeah, certainly is. I'll, I'll let you keep going. We've got a lot to cover. I, th I think Rebecca had a question. Sure. Oh, thanks. I, can you explain the operating expenses? Why why they went up so much in 2020? And also, um, if you could briefly share what you're assuming about fares in 2021 that they stay down like that. Oh, sure. Yeah, so the, the increase that you see in our operating expenses going from 642 million up to 733 million uh, from 2019 to 2020 is mainly because of the opening of additional lines. So that the North Metro line, plus we have, we have full years on some of the other operating uh, lines. So that's really just an increase in the service that we're providing out there. It's nothing, it's, it's not adding to our um, existing service necessarily, it's just new service that's been put out. And then on the- uh, In 21. I'm sorry, what's that? Why does that then go back down in 21? Oh, sure. So that actually goes back down and I'll have a slide a little bit to show that um, all the, the 
cost cutting that we've put in place. So that's going to be the big decrease um, that you see between these two years of almost 100 million is a lot of it's from um, the layoffs that are pending and uh, additional uh, cost cutting measures. Like I said, we've put off not just capital expenditures, but a lot of our um, O&M maintenance projects. Like if we needed to replace a roof or resurface a, a park and ride, all of those types of projects have been delayed just to save money. Thanks. Um, sure, up on the revenue side. So what we're assuming there is that our, our fair revenue is gonna come in at about 55%. Um, so we're we're anticipating 50% in 2020, and then we thought maybe we'd have some riders come back, and in, in, we've seen just a very slight uptick this year. So we're assuming 55% of our normal on the fares in 2021, um, and so that remains to be seen. You know, just a comment on that, and it does seem like it's going to be a, an optimistic estimate that we're going to get most people vaccinated by mid-year. And even if we do, there's still an awful lot of people that are afraid. I think one of the things we need to think about is how we get a better understanding of the customers that we have lost and why they're not using using transit now. Because we've got to figure out how to, you know, how to be focused in in recruiting those people back. Right. Chris Frampton, aren't those people just not going to work right now? There's some that aren't going to work. There's some people that are working at home, but there, I believe, quite a few people that are afraid of COVID. And I think a lot of the riders that we've got right now are the people that are transit dependent. So if you look at how far it's fallen, it, it, it didn't fall to half, basically just on the basis of people who've lost their jobs and who are working at home. So um, We'll have to see. I mean, the, the other thing you can look at is you can look at occupancy of downtown real estate, commercial real estate especially, and boy, it's in, it's in, tough, in a tough place too. So I don't know. The point is we don't know, but I think we've got to figure it out so that we are intelligent in how we try to rebuild our ridership. And that involves some surveying of, the, of the, those communities. I'm, I'm doing some work on ideas for that. But Doug, I don't want to cut you off. Keep going. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'll I'll just hurry through these other slides. Um, uh, these are just for when you have time to take a look at. But these are some of the the guidance that the board had put forth for us in terms of what we should consider in order of priority for cost cutting. Um, I won't spend any time on those. And then additional cost reductions. So we basically, you can see from these categories, we basically carved out cut out all of the um, kind of uh, discretionary spending. We did that in 2020 and continue to do that in 2021. Um, but we're gonna take some other additional cost measure cutting um, that are more significant. Uh, here, actually today, we're sending out notices to some employees uh, that they're uh, being laid off. They'll get two months of severance and uh, benefits, two months of wages and benefits. As part of their pay, then our larger um, notice is going to go out uh, between the 6th and the 9th of January. So that'll have a significant impact on our, our costs in 2021 to the better. Um, but you can just see here, we've, we've instituted a lot of other cost cutting measures for folks that are uh, remaining on. We have furloughs, paid reductions uh, that are tiered toward, and they're geared towards um, impacting mainly the higher, higher, more highly compensated employees. Uh, those will have a significant impact as well. Um, and then some of the benefits have been reduced as well. Um, and then here's what I was talking about with the layoffs. So we're, we're calling it right sizing the organization. Uh, one of the problems that we've had in the past is we didn't have enough, particularly bus operators and uh, light rail operators to produce the service that we were putting out. We were actually um, mandating overtime for um, most of our uh, operation staff. With when COVID hit, um, we were actually working um, with a, a, a consulting firm that was looking at uh, re, the reimagine RTD process. And it was, what do we want to do with our resources that we have and the service that we want to put out and trying to align those? Well, when COVID hit, that whole, um, that whole process kind of had to be looked at again. What are we going to look like going forward with this reduced service level? So right now we've kept 100% of our employees, but we're um, operating at a 60% level. Um, or sorry, we've had a 60% reduction in ridership and we're uh, 
yeah, we're, we're operating at a 60% level of service. So we've reduced our service by 40%. So we have a lot of folks that are really excess. So we're reducing our staffing by 25 to 30% this month and next month. Okay. Um, I won't go through this, but um, I will point out the number in the lower right-hand corner. This is our asset management plan for our capital costs. Oops. Um, so we have 103 million almost of uh, delayed projects. Uh, the biggest numbers there are replacement of rolling stock, our, our buses mainly um, that have reached end of life. Um, so a lot of those uh, replacements have been pushed out just because of our funding constraints. Um, the next slide is just some of the projects on the operations and maintenance side as opposed to capital of some of the projects that we've pushed out as well. Um, which will be needed to be done at some point in time, but um, we've been able to push those out at least and delay them for now. So there's another 5.8 million there. Um, and then, um, so this one is, I'll, I won't spend a lot of time on this one either, but one of the things that we did, especially we've been focusing on fast tracks because at least in our six year plan, we've been able to balance our budget on the base system side but we have that previously discussed problem on fast tracks where when you get out to 2023 through 2026, we are actually unbalanced and we have a deficit and we're using a lot of reserves. So um, what we're doing here is we're, um, we've identified some items where we think we have funding sources for fast tracks with some additional money coming in um, in the near term of about 16.1 million and then possibly another 48 million. But some of these items are, are really tentative right now, especially like the credit risk premium that requires legislation, but we've tried to identify possible funding sources to get us out of the hole. Um, yesterday, we just refinanced these Eagle private activity bonds. We actually will save 33 million on those over 20 years. And in January, we're gonna come to the board with another uh, refinancing for interest savings on the fast track side that we think will save us about 80 million over 20 years. So we are trying to nip away at our debt service obligations by taking advantage of low interest rates. And uh, I'll leave, that's kind of a quick run through. So I'll, I'll leave it up to you all if you wanna ask questions or if there's something I missed, please let me know. Hey, Doug, can you send a copy of, of this to Ron or Matthew? And so, and can you distribute it out to all the committee members? It's a good yes, presentation. It, you know, I, I spent some time on the financials and it's, it's a little hard to really see where everything is and coming from. Sure, sure. But, Sounds good. Uh, this is a good presentation. I, I appreciate it. Uh, uh, committee members, anybody else have questions? Ron? Thanks, Rod. Hey, Doug, thank you for going back to this slide on the comparison. So I, I noticed that for the 2020 amended budget with the CARES account, accounting for the CARES Act funding, your amended budgeted revenues are 1.7 billion and your amended expenditures are uh, 1.9 billion. So, uh, you know, about 80, about $80 million in excess revenue. So what, what happens to that revenue? Correct, and that's a great question. So what's not shown here is um, our reserves. So what we try to do is every year we have fluctuations in our, our revenue and expenses. So we'll have some years like in 2019 where our total revenues are less than our total expenditures. So what we do is we have unrestricted fund balance um, that uh, is basically like our savings account. Um, we have several reserves set aside and we review these with the board and through the budgeting process. Anytime we have excess funds, we build those reserves up. Um, our, in our fiscal policies, what our fiscal policy says is that we will have a target of uh, three, month, three months of operating expenses in those reserve accounts because um, last time we had a recession in 2008, 2009, um, we didn't really have much in the way of reserves, so we really had to scramble, cut service, cut our expenses. So that kind of gives us a cushion for these ups and downs that we see year to year. So that difference in 2020 is actually going to build our reserves back up that we've been using um, in prior years. And the reason we have that is the CARES grants, backfilling some of our other expenses. Correct. Yeah, if we had, we're have CARES grants going forward. We'll see. Right. Right. Yeah. That and that was a savior because if we hadn't had that in probably the May June timeframe, we would have had to 
probably do layoffs and other things immediately because we just wouldn't have have had the cash to keep the expenditure levels that we have incurred since then okay anybody else before we move on yeah if i can if i can follow up on that so it's if the if rtd res receives another uh set of stimulus dollars here in early 21 is the thought that that'd be a similar strategy that it would go towards building up reserves because it there's only a 30 million or so gap um, right now or or expanding service or are you guys not there yet no that's a good question and we've had several of those discussions with the board and staff has put forth some recommendations in order of priority and um, so we haven't we haven't asked the board to um, give us their priorities, but we kind of put some principles together. And the order of priority would be uh, certain things like some of these uh, delayed projects that we have um, in order, order to keep all of our assets. We have about $7 billion in assets in order to keep them in uh, good working condition as required by the FTA. That was one of the high priority items as we start to uh, put the, any additional funds towards those types of items. Um, we also look at would look at service if more service is warranted, and then um, just kind of that that waterfall of uh, priority items. So we haven't identified exactly how that would happen until the funds actually come in, but we've at least established some principles around that. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's talk about peer transit past programs and best practices. Uh, Natalie, are you ready? Yeah, I am. You need to control the I think I just need, yeah. Okay, Ron, Ron looks like he's focused. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie should be able to present now. I think should. so. Can you fill the screen with it? Run it as a slideshow. Telling me it's paused. I'm not sure why. Yeah, at the very bottom, there's the little screen. Yeah, there you go. I saw it. Nope. Oh, but now you're seeing presenter mode, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people are on smaller screens and they need to have as much of it as they can get. Yeah. All right, hang on. <laughs> it's okay. Play from current slide or play from start. Yeah, it's. Yeah, the other thing down at the very no, bottom uh, in that orange area, you got it. Good. Okay, go. you're on. All right, great. So I'm going to present on um, the Houston Metro passes and fares. Um, I know that the um, the peer agency past program slides were also included and I presented to the operations subcommittee a couple weeks ago um, on the peer agency programs, which um, if you wanna take a look at those, the slides give a pretty um, broad overview, high level. Um, but it was noted in that meeting that uh, while those are the peer agency past programs, it doesn't necessarily um, capture best practices in past programs and fairs. So later on today, the in the operations subcommittee, there's also going to be a presentation on best practices from Portland TriMet, King County, um, and San Francisco MTA. Um, and then I'm going to supplement that with um, Houston Metro passes and fairs. Um, so again, Houston is not a um, peer agency as we've identified them. Um, so it, it serves a smaller area and has a higher density. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, let's see how we're going to slide. All right. So these are the different fair media options for um, Houston Metro. We have the 
Metro Q fare card. So that's a reloadable card with an online portal to uh, view and recharge your balance. For every five or for every 50 trips, you get five free trips. Um, and this is kind of the main card for somebody who uses Metro or for you, who uses transit um, one to two times per day. And then you also have the Metro Day Pass, which is more cost effective for people who use transit three times or more a day. And then you have an option for Metro Money, which is a preloaded card. Um, it doesn't, it's not a reloadable card. So it's a set amount of money and you use it and then it's done. And then there is also the Metro Q uh, mobile ticketing app and that's just in-app purchasing and mobile um, tickets. All right, so this is just a comparison, it's kind of small, sorry, but it's a comparison of the two main fare cards. So you have the Metro Q fare card and the day pass. So again, the Metro Q fare card offers the best value for people who use it once or twice or less per day. And then the Metro day pass, um, it caps fares. So once you use it, you pay full price for your first um, two trips, and then the third third trip is 50% off, and then after that, it's free. So uh, fares are capped after uh, three trips. Um, other comparisons, um, they offer similar dis um, discounts, and I'll go over discounts in just a moment. Um, and again, it's just kind of a difference in how frequent um, of a rider someone is. Right. And so this is the fare structure. So for the local bus, the Metro Rail, and the Metro Rapid, um, the fare is 125 per ride. It's a flat rate within the Houston um, local downtown area. Um, the discount rate is 60 cents per ride, um, and it's just a 50% rate rounded down. And the discounted rate is offered for students, seniors 65 to 69, and people with disabilities. And there are free fares offered for children, uh, jurors, seniors 70 and up, and Metro veterans pass holders who are um, decorated or disabled veterans. Um, so I think this was one of the more interesting parts of um, this fare structure in this past program is that there is a flat low rate of 125 um, per ride. However, there are also park and ride zones for commuters outside of Houston, and those are zoned fares. And so this is just from their website, but this is um, a map and you kind of have this spoke, this wheel and spoke. Um, design in Houston. So within that center is where you'll have the flat rate. But then once you get out and you have commuting, um, then you get into zoned fares. So just kind of for some um, uh, frame of reference, <laughs> I had to look it up because I wasn't really, I'm not familiar with the Houston area, but Conroe is about 40 miles out of downtown Houston. So that's where you get that um, high, higher zone fare. And then if you look at somewhere that's purple, like Maxi Road, that's more like 12 miles outside of the downtown area. And then these are just more links. So if you go into the agenda packet, you can um, do a little more digging if you're interested. Um, and I think that is all I have. Great. So I've, you know, I've spent a little time looking at RTD fare structures and passes and everything. It, it really does seem to be pretty complex. A lot of a lot of different options. I know that uh, there's a fair amount of effort in other committees to look at simplification there. Um, so we will, since you're involved in that, we will look forward to brief reports of how it's going in some of the other committees in the future. Okay. Anything, any questions from the committee members or others? 
Okay. Let's. Uh, I guess it, it would be helpful context to know, given that fair structure, what does that mean for the the role fairs play for Dallas? I'm just wondering you know, the the relevance to the, our work for some of what Natalie shared, um, and how that. What link should we be making <laughs> from yeah. what you shared to what's before us? I I actually I looked into the um, transit profiles and it looks like I don't remember the exact number, but I think that um, fares make up more like twelve percent of their operating expenses. So um, definitely a less less of a um, significant portion of their okay. um, revenue. Yeah. So their fare box ratios must be pretty high for Houston. It means they're subsidizing that service pretty heavily if it's only 12%. Right, and I think um, it was local funds had about 70, 76%, I think was the number that I saw. Do you know what their main source their of budget. revenue is? Where do they get the money to run their transit system? Um, I think local funds. Um, local meaning from the Houston metro area, from the city and county of, well. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I'm not actually, I'm not sure. It's just basically based on the um, the national transit database profile is yeah. category of local funds. I'm not sure exactly what that um, okay, makes sense. Okay, so. Uh, accountability committee consultant services. Uh, I think Rebecca, you and Ron are signed up for this. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I may ask uh, Ron to go ahead and start um, sort of sharing what's on the, the docket for uh, North Highland. Sure. So we've been having some conversations with North Highland, the, the consultants that have been um, retained to support the accountability committee's work. I think based on the questions and issues the finance committee has been looking at so far, uh, we feel like the most immediate needs are uh, to really focus in on sort of the um, RTD sort of organizational staffing review, um, sort of staffing by department, staffing levels, issues like management to kind of direct service delivery um, staffing ratios um, and trying to trying to look at that in the context of sort of best practices or industry standards um, uh, kind of just get a sense for how RTD is sort of expending those um, those labor costs um, as as a proportion of their available resources and then the second big thing is kind of helping us dig more into um, kind of the the CARES Act expenditures, um, the information that we've received from RTD and helping dig into that a little bit with the with the goal of really understanding those decisions um, and helping inform any feedback the accountability committee might want to provide in terms of, you know, if there is a next round of uh, federal relief uh, resources that might go to go to RTD. Um, you know, is there any is there any feedback or recommendations the committee might want to make to RTD uh, for any next rounds? Considering that you know the RTD board just adopted a 21 budget that um, shows you know indicates some significant reductions um, in both services and staffing. You know how how to best utilize any any additional resources that might come um, in the context of any lessons learned from the use of the of the CARES Act funding um, this year. Uh, we do have a we do have a task order uh, with the consultants already in place to help with with re with research. Um, so kind of the initial parts of of those priority areas can be can be handled uh, through that task order. And then as as we get into more, into more uh, analysis and they have additional questions, uh, kind of any paths that emerge from that, then we can we can do additional task task orders or amend that task order. Well, well, one, get everything. One of the questions Back I and Matthew met with them a week and a half ago. Yeah. One of the questions I always have is: Do you do we have any idea what they'll be charging and how many hours they'll be putting in on this? And you know, we have a limit, relatively limited budget within all of the RTD accountability committee. So, 
I yeah, we, we don't have a we don't have a firm number yet. Uh, we wanted to make sure that this committee is comfortable with sort of those priority areas. We've, we'll have a follow-up conversation with the committee we'll, or with the consultants. We'll get them the information that we have from RTD uh, to inform that investigation. Our initial task order with the consultant for research is $15,000, so a relatively modest um, amount of the $100,000 co total contract. So we'll we'll kind of see how far we we go with that. We're not we're not anticipating spending half of the consultant budget on this effort. <laughs> No, I'm not anticipating that either. I might get a call from some of those other committee chairmen. <laughs> Brett? Yes, Lynn? Um, I just have a question in, in terms of your timing on the, the staffing review. Um, you know, there's a, a big layoff coming, unfortunately, and uh, um, nobody's happy about that. But, uh, you know, I think that the first uh, notices went out yesterday. The notices... I'm pretty sure Doug can correct me, but um, the notices for non-represented employees um, that will be laid off or will be coming out in January. So I think your timing is important or, or uh, you know, making sure you're getting the right information in terms of the staffing review. I, I don't know how much you're looking at senior staff and how much you're looking at, at uh, bus drivers and people like that. How varied is this? What's we're, trying, for the consultant? we're trying to look at the total staffing picture at RTD. Um, kind of the baseline is the 2020 budget. So we're, we're our understanding from RTD staff is we're close to getting an accounting of that information by department by um, job classification uh, as the baseline. And <laughs> we're trying to figure out with RTD how to get the information for the adopted 2021 budget. Right. Um, since the board adopted a top line um, sort of labor costs and fringe benefit number, um, obviously that was calculated based on some assumptions. Um, the GM has discretion um, uh, to make sort of staffing decisions. We're trying to figure out, knowing that the, the landscape is shifting a little bit, um, knowing that the revenue kind of numbers change a bit, um, and knowing that there's some sensitivity around the fact that layoff notices haven't gone out, that these are real people, but wanting to do an analysis and understand sort of where those where those um, position eliminations are happening. So we're we're working uh, directly with RTD staff to see how to sort of balance all that and get get good meaningful information that that can inform sort of. Uh, review by the committee and and good decision making, but uh, um, is um, I guess that RTD is willing to share with us. Well, to, to Lynn's point, though, and I think it's really a good one, Lynn. If if we show what the numbers are before the layoffs occur, then and you look at the level of service that we're at right now and things like that, I think we we very easily could present a misrepresentative. Uh, situation to the people who are going to be consuming this information and it, it'll be public and so we want to make sure that it's fair to RTD but it's also accurate you know in terms of being able to evaluate ourselves relative to other agencies there's where we have been and there's where we will be after these adjustments and I think it's it's important to recognize that RTD's really done some uh, pretty pretty tough cutting here. And as a result of that, their numbers may be more in line with other agencies. So maybe we shouldn't rush out the reporting of these numbers until we have that, and until we're confident that we have good numbers on what it will be after the this these two rounds of cuts. So does it go out in the interim end of the year report or does it have to go out later than that i don't know if you can get good estimates of what it would be after the cuts then i'm in favor of moving ahead with releasing it but i otherwise would want to wait until we really had a, a fair comparison does that make sense uh rebecca what do you think yeah it, and i think the other constraint here is is what we can feasibly uh, accomplish in the next three to four weeks. So it, I, based on what Ron told me, I think North Highland will need a little bit more time 
um, as we're still waiting on some of the information from RTD. So just by the, the fact of when we'll, we'll get this, I don't know that it, it makes sense to try to include in the end of the year report. Yeah, I, I think in the end of year report, we might say this is something we're working on and here's what we're doing. Yeah, here's good. why we're delayed in delivering it, but we expect to provide this information, you know, the, after the beginning of the year. Lynn, does that sound reasonable and fair? Sure, thanks. Yeah, no, I think that's a good approach. Thanks for raising that point. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, any other comments or questions on this? Uh, okay, status of finance subcommittee goals. Would you like me to pull up that table, Rhett? Yeah, I really, I really would appreciate that. Thanks as always, Ron. And part of what we want to do here is we want to say, all right, what are what are we going to try to get done when? And I think some of the stuff is clear that you know, in terms of what we've been talking about with legislation, I think we're in a pretty good position to move ahead with that. And I think that will be the the intent. Uh, as far as uh, as far as the CARES Act stuff, I, I felt like we were in a pretty good position of knowing what what the money was spent on and where. I think the legislature and the governor's office, that was a, for whatever reason, was a hot topic for them. I, I think RTD, they need to understand that where RTD spent that money. And I'm pretty comfortable with where they spent that money. Uh, but I, I you know, my question is, is this something that we reasonably can expect to have the answers to by year end? Anybody, anybody? <laughs> Rudd, I, I think so. It sounds like North Highland um, is, is going to start giving us their impressions and, and Ron, correct me if I'm wrong, but they could do that in a relatively short turnaround this sometime this month. Yeah, we think so. I mean, I, we're we're scheduling. We're we're in the process of scheduling a a, a staff to staff meeting uh, with the consultants, with uh, me and Matthew, uh, with Doug McLeod, uh, to kind of talk through some of the details of the information that we have, the spreadsheet information we have received from RTD on CARES Act money funding. So I think I think in fairly short order we can kind of get through that get through that process and have a pretty good, better understanding of sort of. The decisions about how that was the accounting for the CARES Act, CARES Act funding, and can prepare a little report back to the committee so that there's you have a, a good basis for discussion and sort of any any recommendations you might want to formulate from that for any new funding that might come. Good. Sounds good. And and uh, Doug will have a chance to look through that and and be comfortable at least with the process that they went through and, and where they got their numbers and be able to fact check it. Doug McLeod. Yes, right. correct. Good. Thanks, Doug. Um, if you look at, at the other things that are that are on here, um, I have to say this this whole issue of of the uh, unfinished corridors is a big issue and a huge financial obligation. And uh, I, I wish I could say that I felt like there was uh, a reasonable opportunity that we'll find some solutions to all the issues that are here on our list, but that one is particularly troubling to me. The, the amount of money that uh, building light rail out uh, to all the unfinished corridors in a situation where just the debt service on what we currently have is as high as it is. And in addition to that, the ridership is, is the other thing that's killing us, uh, partially because of COVID. But ridership on a lot of our new developments wasn't looking great before, uh, before COVID hit. So yeah, I've, I've got really, uh, a lot of heartburn over over that part of it. Um, there was uh, a note from Elise talking about the potential to uh, 
tie this into some of the uh, work on the uh, uh, what's it called the uh, main line this this idea of having Pueblo to um, Fort Collins or wherever uh, a, a passenger line and and uh, whether or not there's some way we could tie into that divert it through Boulder or near Boulder or whatever and and try to use that as one way of addressing some of the challenges here. Rebecca, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? You know what, um, I think it's worth talking about and, and maybe what I can offer is, is CDOT's involved in that study, but there is a, a separate commission for that called the Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. Um, but it might be worthwhile to have one of the agenda items be a quick update on the status of that work. Um, you know, where it is and where it isn't in terms of it's uh, an environmental study and uh, sort of the engineering work that's gone in so far. Would that be helpful, Rhett? Then yeah, we'll all be starting from the same. Can we get that by the next meeting, do you think? Oh, yeah. Part? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've read articles about that and in, in looked at front range passenger rail some boy the economics of that i just can't figure it out uh how how that's going to really serve enough people to i don't know how hard you'd looked at it. i'm sure it's a, a very sensitive political topic and i'll probably get some hate emails as a, just by mentioning it here <laughs> but i tell you it's it's uh it's a lot of money i mean it's like a I've always followed what's going on on I-70 and what the potential is there uh, in, in terms of doing something about the extreme traffic congestion that we have on I-70. And I put a lot of thought into that. I tell you, it is a tough problem. The idea we're going to be able, be able to build rail out to Grand Junction on I-70 through the mountains is just no way that's going to happen, you know, until we we get flying planes or some kind of other services, flying cars. We have we have flying planes, right? Like, yeah, we got flying planes. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think we have the mass the mass transit solution for for that corridor. And uh, you know, I, I see the same thing the same thing with this uh, corridor uh, front range passenger corridor. I, the economics of it. You know, sorry, but I'm you know I'm a small business startup guy. The numbers just really have a hard time making them work. But Lynn, do you have a solution? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? Well, um, yeah, sure would. Bill Van Meter gave a presentation um, yesterday on Front Range Passenger Rail and this new proposal from Amtrak. I gave it twice, once to the board and earlier in the day to a group of uh, stakeholders from the Northwest Corridor. And, um, uh, you know, there, I totally agree with you. The money is is huge. There's some, uh, this, some action in the sense that uh, Amtrak is, is working to get authorization and funding for new corridors, um, smaller corridors, and, and uh, suggest that, that the uh, uh, front range is among its very top and um, uh, you know I guess with the idea that there will be infrastructure and stimulus um, bills coming up uh, you know there's and that uh, uh, our new president is 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 nicknamed our new president elect his nickname is Amtrak Joe um, you know that there's there's something well, there's wrote it a lot, but, yeah. what's that you wrote it. You wrote on Amtrak a lot. However, well, I think it, you know if you're looking for a, a presentation, I think that that uh, at least looking at both of those, and Rebecca may have more to say on this. I think both are both you know at this point probably real long shots, but um, uh, less long shots than maybe they used to be in the sense of, of uh, infrastructure funding and some of those things. Well, it sounds like Bill Van Meter's been looking pretty hard into this. And maybe he would be a good one since he has that RTD perspective to provide us with uh, what he sees is where that might be good. It's a good presentation and, and he's on the commission, the Front Range Rail Commission. Rebecca, what do you think? 
Yeah, he, uh, he is on the commission. I mean, I might want to um, share this request with the chair and vice chair of the commission, just uh -huh. so that they know, and and maybe we can just get back to you. Okay. Okay. Let's form a, a plan for it. But Ron, let's make sure that this fits on our yeah. next. Uh, we'll put we'll put this on the next agenda, and if you give give me and Rebecca a little bit of latitude to sort of work with Front Range Rail. Front Range Passenger Rail Commission and Bill and kind of see see how we might best present a summary to the committee. Yeah, good, cool. good. It may be that both, you know, that it's both of them uh, having something to contribute to this as well. Uh, Dan, have you got any comments or questions or thoughts on all this or anything else we covered today? Well, I, I did uh, have a question on the topic of equity in terms of funds being uh, spent where generated. And uh, so far, and I haven't, uh, I have to confess, I haven't looked over all of the information that's been made available. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't seen anything that that shows uh, where the revenues are being generated and what amounts uh, relative to what services are being provided. And I'm wondering if whether or not RTD staff or the consulting firm could put together some simple graphic or something that allows us to kind of look at those so that we have a sense of whether or not there's equity and and uh, you know, from that maybe we could develop some recommendations or at least have a better handle on on what's going on out there. I think I think Elise would second that. You know, she she has been adamant about wanting to get a better understanding of. Uh, Utilization of funds, particularly from uh, the areas, you know, Boulder and that whole Northwest Corridor area. They feel like they put a lot of tax in the, into this and they're not getting their return. So <clears throat> I sympathize with that. And uh, and so I think we need to keep pounding on that one. Okay. Let's see how we get that response. I'll let Ron and Dr. Todd follow up for us on that. Well, well that's that's about it. We're out of, uh, out of time, and and uh, I want to thank everyone for your contribution and your ongoing contributions, and wish you the merriest Christmas and the happiest holidays for this season. So, right, I did just did want to just note for folks that um, I did have an error in the agenda. The next meeting is not today. This was this was today's meeting. The next the next meeting is in two weeks. Um, and there were some additional attachments to the agenda packet, some background information that relate to some upcoming agenda topics that the committee's talked about. So at your at your availability, review that information and look for future agenda topics related to those. Very good. I've got some right here that I want to get in, in there. So, all right. Anything else, anybody? Then I declare this meeting adjourned. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.